Yeah, there you go. That's good. All right, come on, fish. You know you want it. <laughs> come on. Uh, maybe not this time. Well, hi there. Hey, uh, thank you for joining me here uh, for our uh, 14th segment in our Red Letter Studies in the Book of John. Uh, in today's uh, lesson, uh, in John chapter 7, we're going to be talking about the ultimate question, you know, uh, the question everybody wants to know. We talked about one of them, and that was, what was my purpose in life? And today, we're going to be talking about now that I'm a part of God's kingdom, what is my destiny? All right? It's going to be an awesome question. I'm glad you're here. Glad you didn't miss this one. And so uh, with that in mind, let's uh, go ahead and dig into uh, John chapter 7. God bless you, and here we go. Well, hello. Here we are. Thank you for joining us for segment number 14 in our Red Letter Studies in the Book of John. Today we'll be in John chapter 7, and like I said in the introduction, we'll be talking about what our destiny is. This is a really, really important question uh, for those who are looking forward to that, that day when, when, when you stand before God and He says, Well done, good and faithful servant. And for those that are looking forward to that day, things like our purpose and our destiny are pretty pretty important to us and um, and so before I get into into John chapter 7 I wanted to talk a little bit about what that destiny what destiny looks like and so you'll you'll kind of see what we're uh, what's going on uh, and of course to begin with we're going to be talking about Jesus and his destiny very clear he had a destiny wasn't it uh, as we go through the word we see his destiny portrayed in many different ways and today you're going to see a few of those ways and and so, what is a destiny? Well, the root is destination, right? The root of destiny is, is that I'm going someplace. I have a, po a point that I'm going to. I just gave you an example of one, and you may not have realized it when I said, I wanted to know, what is it gonna t what's going to happen in my life so, to, so that when I get to stand before God and God looks at me and looks at my life, He says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your reward. Okay, uh, that's a destination. That's a moment in time. That's a place. That's a location. It's a purpose. It's, it's uh, I'm, I'm heading some way. I'm not just wandering, meandering through life. Although sometimes it may appear to be that way, uh, that is not the way it is. I have a very clear destination. And, and, uh, and as you well know, Jesus came to life with a very clear destination. And, and he wasn't one apt to allow anything to get between him and that destination or that destiny. And so, um, and one of the other things I'm going to talking about is predestination. That word does appear in the scriptures as well. What is a predestination? Well, essentially it can be summed up this, be, that your destination was decided before the foundations of the earth. Pre, before, right? Before you even were born. Um, and hundreds and thousands before the creation of the world itself, God had a, had a plan for you. And so, and so that is your predestination. Now, one of the reasons why it's important for me to bring this up, because there's a large body of, I don't know, that's not the right word. There's a, a large uh, section or portion of the body. There we go. A large portion of the body of Christ that has misunderstood this, this term, predestination. And, um, and, and the reason uh, that they've misunderstood it is because, is because they think that predestination is talking about um, our salvation when it's not. Uh, predestination is talking about our purpose. Uh, once we've received Christ as our Savior, our destination, our purpose. And I'm going to show you the scriptures that have been misappropriated. Um, but the thing is, is that when, when people don't understand that we have a purpose, 
and that we do have a destination in this life and in the life to come that uh, all they think is is all there is is salvation the only thing our only purpose in life is to be born again and uh, and 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 folks that believe along that line believe that that we don't even figure into our salvation experience um, what it means is that some were predestined to be saved and some were not and so even if you want to be saved you can't be saved and even if you don't want to be saved you're gonna be saved whether you like it or not <laughs> okay and and uh, it's the Christian version of natural selection I suppose if you look at it that way you don't have any choice in the matter okay where you fall in the food chain and uh, and of course this is ludicrous for those who read the Bible because we understand that our volition that you'll call our free will is an intricate and an essential part of the salvation experience and when God is choosing a bride for himself he's not just creating another uh, another uh, being that can only do what it can do he created us unique from the rest of creation by this that we have our own will that we can choose God or we can choose not and 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 as you've heard me talk about before I've compared it to the love relationship between a man and a woman because that is our uh, that is our example that's uh, the that a, uh, that a godly marriage begins this way that two people have chosen each other okay and uh, uh, and we were not coerced not forced we weren't it wasn't put upon us I had a choice in who I was gonna marry not everybody of course has that choice around the world but the biblical model for us is this is that that God has a mate for us and and he has prepared him and he has prepared her but we come together um, of our own free will I know like in in one of the one example in my life uh, it's one of those destination moments my oldest daughter um, um, she uh, met a guy and the moment I heard his name the Lord said he's the one and then he told me to leave him alone <laughs> to, to let let uh, let him uh, let him approach my daughter and you know, and of course I'm you know been being really protective of I that I have been I've been protecting her for him and so it was really important that I knew that um, that he was the one and uh, so I was able to let them court and, and ultimately get married and but the thing is I never told my daughter what the Lord told me until after she accepted the proposal of marriage because even this I did not want to influence the choice her choice um, she had to choose him for herself and she did <laughs> you know and that was really important to me is like I told her it's like you know at one point we're getting ready to go down the aisle and I and I told her I says look sweetheart I says this is your last moment you know the choices are all yours at this point you don't have to marry uh, get married today and uh, is this the man you really really want and you know because you know um, a marriage is for a lifetime and you need to know that before we get started and so she says yes daddy this is the one and I knew it already was you know of course but I wanted her to know that it was her choice to make and that's what I'm getting at and she made that choice and and they've done very very well together and I'm so grateful there's in a moment there's an experience right there that um, regarding destiny um, see God spoke he's the one and so that set in motion a, a, um, a line of events that now that have produced a lot of beautiful grandchildren for me <laughs> and uh, that kind of thing and so anyway um, there's a turn in the moment in time and a choice is made and so God has made it so that we have to make a choice we make the choice whether we're gonna uh, receive salvation and then once we receive that salvation we're gonna make a choice what we're gonna mean uh, in in uh, in the kingdom of heaven and how important God really is to us is he just our fire insurance policy or is he the lover of our soul so that's kind of what we're gonna talk about and uh, and so um, you'll see in a few minutes when I get to it particularly in Ephesians 1 and Romans 8 where he talks about predestination that he's talking about that we have been predestinated to his purpose that he's got something going on and uh, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes and so um, one thing that's really important for you to understand though and most people don't understand this I know I've been in a lot of uh, a lot of conversations and counseling sessions with young men and women and mentoring them and and uh, we've got in our minds this idea that if I have a destiny then um, 
then it uh, then there's nothing I can do about it. I mean, it's it's going to come heck or high water. That is what's going to happen in my life. No matter what I do, I have a destiny a destiny, and it cannot be avoided. Um, and but what you're really talking about is predetermination, and that is completely different. Okay, predetermination is what I was just talking about. When somebody thinks that that uh, God has already determined before the foundation of the earth that this is what will happen, uh, no, irregardless of what choices I make, and and that is just not so. And I'm going to show you in a moment too that that Jesus Himself uh, had a destiny. We all know that, but even Jesus did not have to fulfill His destiny, and. Uh, and actually, I'll even just go ahead and show you. It's like in, in, in the last moments, you know, all along the way, of course, he had a choice in the matter. The thing is, is that if Jesus didn't have a choice in the matter, okay, he couldn't save us. You know, he had to actually choose righteousness. He had to choose not to sin. He had to choose to go to the cross. All of these things were choices that he had to make all along the way. At any one point, he could have done otherwise. And uh, as you know, if he had, what would have become of us? All right, that we all have a choice. Even Jesus had a choice. And, and for example, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the last night, you know, he's like, he's, you know, he's so grievous over what he's about to do the next day that he's sweating blood. And he, uh, and he prays to the Father uh, twice, matter of fact, and he says, Father, if there's any other way, let's do that. Okay, if there's any other way to do what needs to be done, let's do that. But there was no other way. And so he said, nevertheless, thy will be done. Okay, and so he went to the cross obeying the Father because there was no other way. The same thing is going to happen in all of our lives. May have already happened in our lives, maybe even numerous times, as it has in my case, where you come to that moment where God is asking you to do something and you got a choice. Are you going to do it or are you not going to do it? Now, what happens is, is that uh, it has been in my experience is that People will get it right some of the time. You know, God will ask them to do something, and sometimes they'll do it if it suits them. Or if it, you know, they might willing to be willing to sacrifice a little bit of their comfort zone. Okay, but ultimately, everybody, it would seem, has a line drawn in the sand over which they will not cross for the cause of God's kingdom. And... Man, I've been up to that point so many times with so many people. Here's the thing. If you've done that, you know, if you've said no to God and, and, uh, and now you've repented and, um, and uh, now you've, you know, you decided and you went back to that starting point, you know, and said, God, can I have a do-over? Let me tell you, there are do-overs, but... Do-overs, trust me, are doing it the hard way. The easy way to be about our destiny is to listen and to obey. Okay, that's the easy way. But God's promise is this, and you'll even see it. We'll read it here in a few moments, where he says that, it says, even when we make bad choices and we don't go the way God really, and we know that God wanted us to go that way and we didn't do it, well, we do know this. It says that God promises that he will cause all things to work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Okay, keep that in mind. Okay, not for everyone. Who does he cause all good things to happen despite all the bad things? That promise doesn't apply to everyone. It applies to who? To those who love God, right? And, and those who have been called according to his purpose. Purpose is so important. Matter of fact, you know, when it comes to destiny, uh, you know, you have no destiny if there's no purpose. You see how they're interrelated. Um, our destiny is to fulfill our purpose. Okay? And so, I'm just telling you that if you're a young person and... 
and, and God is calling you to do something right now, or if he does in the very near future, or for the rest of your life, <laughs> okay, my advice to you is if the Spirit of God speaks to you and, say, and says, turn to the left, or if he says, turn to the right, or if he says, sit, stand still for this moment, or if he says, do this or do that or don't do this, you know, those moments, obey the voice of the Lord. That's the easy way. Now, I've seen plenty of times, many times, people have, you know, I've told them, this is what God has called you to do, and this is what God wants you to do, and here's the choices you can make, and they went and did their own thing. And about five, six years later, they come back, okay, and, and they went out and, you know, made their choices, done things their way, and got, got all, you know, and now they come back, and they've got all this baggage, <laughs> all this stuff that they went through, and now they're trying to make it right. They're trying to get in the right spot with God. And, uh, and, and, and sure enough, God will be faithful. But let me tell you that all that stuff you brought with you is going to be a burden on you, okay? And it's going to thwart God's plans for you, you know? Um, his, 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 his calling that he's had for you will continue. His purpose for you will continue. But let me tell you, it's going to be rough. And you're not going to end up exactly where God wanted you to end up in the beginning, you know, we've got a lot of examples that, you know, like, for example, one just flew through my mind just now that that Israel's the, the destiny for Israel was this, that they were destined and, and mind this word inheritance, because it's going to come up in a minute. They had an inheritance in the promised land and that was their destiny. OK, but not any of that generation got to fulfill their destiny. They did not get to serve the purpose. Instead, they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years and God did good. He made good of that, all right? And then that generation and the next generation had the same opportunity to fulfill their destiny. And this generation did, you know, and they got to go into the land and, you know, and, and, and so the story goes on. But this destiny is not a sure thing. You know, it is just not. It, um, that you have the opportunity every day to thwart God's plan for you. And, and uh, if you want what God wants for your life, then my advice is to do what God tells you to do when he tells you to do it. Um, sure enough, you know, um, maybe... Uh, you'll get to come back and maybe you got and you know, you'll get to do what God has done and you know called you to do But it's not going to be without a lot of suffering And uh, and so I don't want to see that happen to you. You know, do you want to see it happen to you? <laughs> so fulfill your destiny allow God to show you um, and so um, um, so in John chapter 7, and, and I'll just read this to you, and then I'll come back to it. And okay, it says, After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk into Judea, because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, uh, the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was near. Therefore his uh, brother said to him, Leave it here and go into Judea, so that your disciples may also, or sorry, also may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For now, for not even his brothers were believing in him. So Jesus said to them, My time uh, is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it does hate me, because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast, because my time has not yet fully come. All right, there's a few things at work here. Two things in particular that I'm going to point out. Is that one is, is that sometimes when you're waiting on your destiny, um, there's two things that are happening. One is, is that if you know what your destiny is, because God has called you to it, but you look around, okay, and you don't see it happening, <laughs> okay? And, uh, and, and you're, you're, man, you're digging in your heels and you're believing God. Well, there's two things, that it's a matter of time, okay? If God says something's going to happen, then it is going to happen, Okay, it's just a matter of time. It's unavoidable. It will happen eventually if you keep doing what is God has called you to do. Above all, believing what he's, told, uh, what he's done and acting upon it. 
Another thing that is happening too, though, is also a matter of timing. Okay, it's a matter of time, and it will happen. It is also a matter of timing when it will happen. You see, because God is orchestrating everything together, and both of these things uh, are happening with Jesus. Um, is that Jesus doesn't struggle so much like we do in following God and obeying God along the way. And, and he knows that he has a destiny and he's all about fulfilling it. Man, he's, he's going there, but he understands that it's a matter of timing as well. And, and one of those things is that, is that Jesus doesn't take a step forward towards his destiny until the Father tells him to. Because it's a matter of timing. And he says, it's not my time yet to reveal myself. And as you go through the scriptures, I want you to do a couple of things. Um, and, and, you know, I can't take you to all the examples right now, but you know what I'm talking. If you've read your Bible at all, and I'm, and I'm asking you as you read your Bible, pay attention to these two things. There are these moments when Jesus talks about his time has not yet come. Or what, you'll, you'll see him, he'll come up to a point and then he'll stop short. And then he'll go in another direction, and then he'll head off that way, and then he'll stop short, and he'll go this way. And he, all this time, he's, 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 you know, it doesn't make sense to anybody else at the time anyway, but, but there's a plan, and he's following that plan, and it matters, okay, that he gets to this moment at this time. You know, and that's one of the things we struggle with. Yeah, you know, I've talked about, man, I wish I could have a do-over. Okay, I wish I could go back and change this and this, and man, I would love to change that. There's just a problem with that, though, is that even if knowing what I know right now, uh, I could go back into, into my past and start all over again, how could I change all those things without also changing all the things I would like to keep? <laughs> all the things that I love about my life, the things that are precious and valuable to me and those important things, you know? How would I get to make sure that I, that, that I got all that? Because you change one thing, you're going to change another thing. And see, Jesus is going through and he's, he's attempting to do two things. One thing is to obey the Lord and to fulfill prophecy. Okay, you see this is because another word. I says, anytime you see there are a reference to his time, Pay attention to that. Maybe mark it with a highlighter in your Bible, okay? Every time that he's, he's saying or implying uh, that, he, uh, that, that there's a matter of time involved in this. And the next one is, is every time it says this word, that the prophecy, so, or so that the prophecy may be fulfilled, he did this or said this, you know? Um, you know, just as one random example that I pull out of my head was the day when he was... Um, um, when he uh, went up in the temple and he opened up the Torah and he, and he talked uh, and, he, and he read the prophecy about his coming and then he closes the book and then, he's, and, then he said, and then he turns to everybody and says, and I say that today this scripture has been fulfilled. <laughs> okay, and boom, he, uh, for a fact he closes the Torah and says, this has been fulfilled. And anytime you see him doing that, highlight that as well. Because what you're talking about is his destiny. Well, I want you to, to keep this in mind as you're doing this, that you also have a destiny. And, and unfortunately, for m most people, you don't have that direct line with God that Jesus had. You can, and you will. You keep with me going here. We're gonna, you're going to get that. Okay, but if you don't have that, it's really difficult for you to know when to turn left or when to turn right or uh, how to do that. And so, but here's, here's the promise that you have from God, that if you, if you believe him, trust him, acknowledge him in all your ways, Proverbs 3, 5, 5 and 6, he will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make your path straight. Okay. So you need to rely upon that until you get to the point where you have a conversational relationship with the Lord that allows you to, to walk in the Spirit and to follow God's leadership in your life. God will get you where you need to be if you're doing your part in this. What were they? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, not leaning on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways and what will happen. He will make your path straight. So pay attention to those things. 
Um, let's see. Um, and so, yeah, I already, I already talked about that. Um, and so I, I, I know one of the things that I'm trying to do as we go through these, I'm trying to give you, share you stories and testimonies and examples, things that, that, that both me and my wife have experienced and our family that demonstrate um, how God does that or how, how he has done that in our life. First of all, um, so that you can know that he will do it in your life, but also some interesting ways that he goes about doing that. And these are important. Um, like I said, I, I commented a, a few moments ago how important it is. If, there, if people wanted to know, what can I do to get where I'm going? You know, uh, my answer is always going to be the same. It's always going to start with, you got to know God's Word. Okay, if it, I've said so many times, and I tell people over and over, I mentored a lot of people. And one of the things that I always tell them in the beginning is, look, if you're not willing to read... I can't help you. If you're not willing to read, I can't help you. I can't, I'm not going to do the work for you. All I'm really going to do is point you in a direction. I'm going to say, I've been there. This is how I got there. Go in that direction. If you've got a better plan, we'll go for it. But I've been there, and I'm just telling you, it's just like my mentor used to say. I would, sometimes I would just say to him, it's like, hey, Ron, I says, this is what I think about this, and this is what I think I should do. What do you think? And he, he would always say the same thing. He says, well, he says, I've done it that way myself, and... And, uh, you know, it didn't work for me. I'm not saying it won't work for you. Maybe you're smarter than me. <laughs> maybe you're a little bit sharper than me. And so maybe it'll work for you. But it didn't work for me, so do whatever you want. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and I'm like, yeah, okay, all right. What do you think I should do, Ron? Okay, and so I'm saying, it, you know, uh, you know, you might be the exception but I promise you, you're not going to be the rule. And I don't think I'm the exception. Okay. And so, and so it is really important that, um, you know, that you, that you, first of all, that you got to get into God's word. Okay. If you want to know God, if you want to be able to hear his voice, if you want to have the spirit in you, I said, you got to be baptized in the spirit, but I'm telling you that you cannot know God without God's word. First of all, because you can't trust any spirit that is talking to you about anything. And I do mean anything unless you know God's word, because I'll tell you what, Satan will come Spirits will come, bad people will come, voices will come, you know, and different voices telling you all kinds of different things. And, and I remember one of the last times I ever really just sat down and just told people what God was saying. And, and I was sitting here with this one young woman and, and uh, in the kitchen, at the kitchen table and, and, uh, and she's wanting direction. Okay, and I have been directing her along the way. She's like, what is, and she's always asking me, she's not asking me what I think about things. She's asking, what does God want me to do? So I say, okay, I'll ask God, and, uh, and, uh, and I'll tell you what God says, just like I do when he tells me what I should do. I'll just do it the same way. And, um, and so she, uh, and so we had that relationship. Okay. But I would, but there was this problem is that I noticed that I would, I would, I would answer her question. This is what God said. This is what you should do. And this is where you should go and how you should do it. Okay. But she wouldn't do it. And I'm getting kind of confused. What's going on here? I thought you wanted to know. And, um, and what I realized, uh, you know, finally this last time that I ever counseled her on, 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 on what God wanted her to do, I finally realized what happened is she was going around asking all kinds of people questions. And so she had all these different voices telling her all these different things about what she should do. And I realized that she was just grouping God's voice in with the rest of those voices and looking for the one that suited her best. And uh, that was the last time I like, I'm sorry. Matter of fact, I really, after that, I struggled with telling anybody, you know, uh, you know, and I just, I kind of fell back and I just said, fine, you know what, I'm just gonna, you know, this works for me. God tells me to do something and I do it and, and it works. Okay. And other people can just do whatever they want. Well, that's a really unfortunate place to be because it's a bad attitude on my part for one. 
you know, I'm not believing in people and I'm getting an attitude about people because they're not listening to what God is saying. So, you know, if you're not going to listen, I'm just not even going to tell you. And, and so you got to know God's word. Um, otherwise, you can't distinguish those voices. And so, and so with that in mind, um, some examples. As a matter of fact, this Ron that I just mentioned, Ron is his name and his wife, his name was Georgia Lee. And um, here's, here's a moment in destiny. It's just a really good example. My wife, when she was about 13, um, she went to this big conference with her mom and dad, and, and this man, Ron and Georgia Lee, were speaking. <clears throat> and he was talking about marriage and relationships and, and uh, you know, and how to have, be a godly husband, how to be a godly wife, and, and you know, and, how, and, and talking about how the man ought to love his wife the way Jesus loves the church and how the woman ought to be respecting her husband, you know, and, and so on. And, and she had never heard these things before. And, and anyway, as she's listening, God spoke to her. And he said, this man... These, this couple here is going to be very influential in your future. He told her that. And she, was, she heard it you know, clearly, and she turned to her mom and says, Mom, God just told me this. And, and her mom just kind of, yeah, whatever, okay, you know, and didn't really pay much attention to it, okay? Well, let's advance a whole bunch of years forward. Forty is, so both my, my wife and I are about 40 years old, and uh, we're introduced to a couple, a couple who's going to become our mentors. <laughs> and the couple that really came to define our whole understanding of the scriptures and, 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 and that mentor opened us up for other mentors in our lives. And guess what their names were? Ron and Georgia Lee. Wow. 40 years old. <laughs> and God's word to my wife when she was 13 was fulfilled that there was a, we had a date with destiny and because God could hear, I'm oh, sorry, because my wife can hear God speaking to her, you know, um, and she did like Mary and we ought to do, this is another good thing, when God speaks to you, do what Mary did, you know, you see those moments, Jesus, you know, mother of Mary, I mean, Jesus' mother of Mary, um, every time something extraordinary would happen, she would hide it away in her heart and just the way that my wife did. And you should do that as well. If God speaks to you and tells you something about your future, hide that away in your heart. Okay, keep it. There's going to come a day like it did for us when you're going to go, oh my gosh, wow, wow. Okay, one of the things that I found about prophecies, and it's an unfortunate reality, but it is true, and most people think that prophecies are for us to know what the future is going to be. And... In some respects, that kind of is, but that's really not what prophecy is for. Prophecy is for those, oh, wow, moments. It's when God tells you something's going to happen, and then someday it happens, and you go, wow. <laughs> it happened just the way God said it would. Wow. Well, you're going to have, if you haven't already, a lot of those moments. And um, so, yeah. And, and um, so uh, another pivotal moment, just one that just makes me laugh. I just love this. It's, it's so cool. And it's kind of funny, too, uh, in a way. But my wife, and she'll even tell you, because she shares her testimony, that she had this really, you know, a close relationship with God where she could hear his voice and walked in the Spirit much better than myself. Um, I really wasn't baptized in the Spirit until, well, after I got that mentor in my life, okay? And, um, and uh, so I was like about 40 years old when I first got baptized in the Spirit. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk more about that later on. That not that I couldn't hear God's voice, but this conversational thing, yeah, that didn't happen until after I was baptized in the Spirit. And there's reasons for that, and I kind of already alluded to it in previous ones. Uh, you might go back and, and, and listen to the video on fire and water is a good example to find some of those uh, that, in that video. And, and so anyway, um, so my wife, she tells her story, in that, uh, but after she left home, um, got to college and she got mixed up with the wrong people and did the wrong things and she ended up falling away from the uh, God and 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 she uh, did a lot of things that she really regrets and and uh, as many of us have and 
And, uh, but anyway, um, but God, <laughs> I always love to say that, but God, you know, but God, <laughs> um, but God intervened and drew her back and, and she, uh, repented of all that and one of the cool things i love about one of the things my wife did and i think this is such a great idea if you're one of those people that have kind of got off course and and now god is calling you back and you want to get your life right with god do what my wife did because i think it's a remarkable thing she uh repented to begin with and then she and then what she did is she wrote herself a constitution and i just think that's really amazing you know, like our Constitution for the United States of America. This is how our, our, our country will be conducted. The business of our affairs, this is how it will happen. Well, she wrote one of those for herself, that from this moment on, this is who I'm going to be, this is what I'm going to do, and so on. And I just, I like to share that example because there's so many other people out there I know that are struggling to understand and how to get from here to there. And, and I think that's a remarkable example, and I'm so proud of my wife for that. And, uh, and so... You know, if you're in that situation, write yourself a constitution too, okay? Amen? Well, anyway, um, so what happened is, is that she's, she, as she tells the story, um, so she's like probably 23, somewhere around, about like that, somewhere in there at that point. And, um, and uh, she's working in this office. And she, you know, and while she was away from the Lord, she'd have been, you know, had had a lot of relationships with all these different sort of people involved in the music industry that she was working in. And uh, so she was really in, in all that. So she had these really artsy people and, you know, and really sophisticated people, all these men that were just, you know, they're just all about that, you know. Uh, yeah, unlike me, <laughs> you know, um, she didn't have a lot of Ford F-350s parked in her driveway before I came along. Let's put it that way. Okay. And, um, and, but anyway, so she's like, she's, um, in her office and she's working and she's just, and at this point she has repented and she's walking with God and, and she's trying to get things right. And, and she says, she says she's lonely and, 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 uh, she really wants to be in a relationship with her mate. You know, who do I belong with? And she's telling the Lord, she says, Lord, um, I'm done. I've repented of all that. I don't want those people, not interested in those guys that I'm interested in anymore. I'm interested in the guy that you're interested in, Lord. And, and, uh, and, uh, and so God, could you please bring him into my life? And at this moment, as she's working at her desk, she, uh, and she says she got this sudden urge to drop what she was doing and go out of the building and go across the street to this store that was a little convenience store across the road. And, uh, and she figured maybe to get a soda, you know, because you know her, she's got to have her Diet Cokes and all that. And so she told her boss that she had to, she had to go take a break and go across the street and, and uh, to the store. And, but her boss said, you know, told her she was on a deadline. She needed to get this, you know, get this project done. And, and, uh, and so she wasn't going to let her go. And my wife says, you don't understand. I have to go to the store and I'm going to the store even if you fire me. Okay. And her, wife, her boss is kind of like, what? That's kind of a little, little intense there, but she did. She just dropped what she's doing and went to the store because she was obeying the voice of the Lord. Okay. Because the Holy Spirit was there telling her, you've got a date with destiny. Okay. And you need to go fulfill it right now. So drop what you're doing and go do it. So she did. She goes across the street, she goes in and she's coming up to the door and it's this place that if you've ever been down in the south, it's called Jim Dandy and they're Jim Dandy convenience stores. And every time, you know, it was, the corny thing was that when, you know, the convenience store clerk, when he would check you out, he would ha always have to say, have a Jim Dandy day. And I thought that was just so funny. And I was like, that would be a reason enough to not have to work. I would never work at that store because they'd make me say, have a Jim Dandy day. <laughs> So anyway, she's walking into the up to the Jim Dandy, and the door swings open for her. She gets to it, and these two redneck-looking guys come rolling out, tumbling out. They're laughing at the clerk about having to say something to say Jim Dandy Day, and and uh, and uh, as they walk past her, this one tall guy and another guy of average height, and and uh, and they come laughing past her, and the and the, the shorter of the two looks around and sees her and takes a look at her and says, "Oh, baby." <laughs> and and uh, then turns and they then both guys laugh and they take off and jump in this big red Chevy truck and 
take off down the road. And, and so my wife, she's just thinking, oh, brother, you know, those are exactly the guys I'm not interested in. And, uh, and uh, so she reaches for the door handle on the store, and the Lord says, says, Marshall, would you marry even that guy if I told you to? And, and she said, yes, Lord, I'd marry even him. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so anyway, then suddenly the urge to go in the store was gone and, which is kind of odd for my wife because she never turns down a Diet Coke <laughs> for anything. And, uh, so she lets go of the door handle and she thought, wow, that's weird and turns around and walks back to the office and didn't even go in the store and went back to work. Guess what happened about six months later? She met the guy that said, oh baby, and jumped in the big red Chevy and that guy was me. <laughs> I think that's a really cool story. I don't know how cool you think it is, and it's hard for me to even talk about it because I gotta go. I think about how God saved my life in that moment too. I had a date with Destiny, and I didn't even know it happened. I was just, you know, just going fat, dumb, and happy through life, and you know, just laughing it up, and and I didn't realize I had just met my future. And. Uh, but my wife, she heard the voice of the Lord. She heard the Spirit, and and uh, and it was a that was a destiny moment. And the reason that story is important is because you don't know how important the moment is that you might be turning away if you turn away from it. Sometimes we think that it's no big deal. You know, it's, it, you know, oh, it was a little thing. I was like, well, God will give me another opportunity. Uh, yeah, maybe not. I, I, I was just sharing an example last week about me, I was going to Maryland and, 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 and that one moment where I said, when I, I thought to not go and God, and I told you what God told me because, you know, we ran out of money and I'm just like, we can't go. And God said to me, he says, Riker, if you do not finish this trip, you will not get to see the blessings that I have prepared for you. You don't know how important it is. You don't understand what is at stake when God is calling you to do something you might miss that moment. So I don't care how silly it looks to you and how it, maybe it's not a big deal. Do it anyway. You know, I remember one time I was back when uh, I was in college and I was going to the university and, and, but it was like a two and a half hour drive, one way to get to the university. And so it was five hours a day that I was driving. Is that insane or what? Well, I didn't have half of it, but I'm not gonna tell that story. But anyway, one of the things we were trying to do is try to get, see if we could move closer to the university. Well, the job I had, I was working, you know, had, I had my own business at the time while I was going through school and mine was transportable. I could do my business up there just as like it could anywhere. And, and so, but my wife on the other hand, which at the time, because I was full-time in college as well as full-time in this business, you know, her job was really important to get us through. And so um, we needed her to have a job. And, uh, but there wasn't anything. And, and so anyway, I'm walking through the cafeteria one day and it's just this huge cafeteria. And I was, you know, on a weird schedule and there was nobody in the cafeteria other than me. And I noticed one guy sitting way back in the corner at a table and all these tables in between me and him. And I'm just going to go sit down for a minute and eat my lunch and, and get to my next class. And, and, uh, but I saw that guy standing over there and I heard the voice of the Lord say, go talk to that guy. And I'm looking around, I'm like, well, this is going to be a little awkward. There's only 500 other tables out here. And I'm going to go walk all the way across here and sit down next to that guy and say, hey, is it okay for me to sit next to you? Well, I felt a little awkward. This is way outside my comfort zone. But you know what I did? I obeyed. Okay. I went, went through all those tables and made a beeline right for that guy. 
and I went and 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 I and he was sitting about as far as way as you are from me now. And I said, "Hi, my name is uh, Riker, and uh, mind if I join you?" And he's like, "Sure, go ahead, sit down." And I'm thinking in my head, "What is God doing here? Why does He want me to talk to this guy?" My first impulse is always to think that maybe He wants me to share the gospel with this guy, okay? And He needs to hear the good news of, of the gospel. And so, in the whole conversation where him and I have it, I'm kind of trying to steer it that way, and it just will not go the way I want it to go. And I really wanted to share him, but it just kind of always drops dead, drops dead, and, you know, the conversation just doesn't come together. I can't get this guy to respond. But an interesting thing happens in the conversation, because I'm asking him questions about his life, and he tells me about his wife. He was, a, you know, a little younger than me, but he was, you know, a married student too. And, and he was saying, and we had this in common, and, and so there was something to talk about. And, and he shared how, you know, they were trying to move closer to the, um, to the university, just like we were. And I thought, wow, we had that in common. And then he said, yeah, my wife, matter of fact, just interviewed for a job yesterday with a mortgage company. But they told her that she wasn't, they didn't, didn't have the ex, as much experience as they needed uh, for this job. And, and so, but maybe your wife does. And there's the moment. Okay, there's the moment. And he told, and, he's, and I said, what bank is this? And so he told me, and he told me the name of the president of the bank. He gave me the guy's phone number. And he says, call this guy. Okay, and guess what I did? I mean, I, call, I immediately called my wife and I says, call this guy at this bank with this phone number and guess what? She got the job and we moved to the Oxford, you know, up to the university in Oxford. And so, um, there you go. I could have disregarded that. It is sure a good thing that I didn't. We got exactly what we were praying for and then I finished out my degree there. And I was so, so grateful that I went and I talked to that guy. So you, do what God tells you to do when he tells you to do it. Okay? Um, here's, here's something else, too. Years ago, back in uh, the early 90s, um, I was asking God about my destiny and my purpose in life. And, and I really wanted to know. We'd gone through a lot of hardship, stuff that I've already, some of the stuff I've already told you about in the early part of our lives. And as a matter of fact, last... Uh, Last weekend, I told you about that, and, and, and we're starting to come through that first part of that mess, and I'm like, God, what, tell me about my future. And it was on a morning where I, I was in at the church. We, there was a group of us at the church that used to get together at 6 o'clock in the morning on Tuesdays and, and pray for the church and for our, our community and for the country and, and, and for prayer requests that we had and that kind of thing. So anyway, and while we're doing that, I'm just start having this conversation, you know, and asking the Lord about my future. And the Lord told me two things. He said, number one, he says, you will be politically influential. And I thought, whoa, that's cool. Never thought about that much. And he says, and Isaiah 58, 12 will define your life. And I went, whoa, Isaiah 58, 12. And I think that's pretty specific. And so, um, so I, I just asked God about my future and he told me something, okay? And, um, and so I went to Isaiah 58, 12, the first thing, because that was pretty easy. And it says this, those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins, you will raise up the age-old foundations, and you will be called the repair of the breach and the restore of the streets in which to dwell. Okay, and so here's my destiny. God says, I will be politically influential. Here's one of the problems that God has with us. Okay, when he tells us something, is that we so often try to figure it out ourselves. What could this mean? And so then we start trying to steer the boat, <laughs> okay? And that's kind of what I started doing. Oh, God wants me to be politically influential. That's what he wants. And so I got involved in politics and I, you know, got involved in, you know, in, uh, you know, the Republicans uh, uh, Central Committee and I, and I got elected to some minor, you know, um, uh, you know, offices within the party and things like that. Okay, and man, I just started getting really political. And then I went and I, and, and I thought that was so great. I went to college and to the university and I got a degree in political science. Okay, because I, man, I'm steering this boat towards politics now because this is what God wants. And, and I figured, man, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to law school. When I get out of law school, then I'm going to go and I'm going to run for office and, and all this kind of stuff. Well, I didn't go on to the law school, but, 
but I did finish my degree and got my degree in political science. And then we, once we relocated out of the university, I, I uh, got involved and I, and, uh, and then I also, I ran for the uh, state house of representatives and, and uh, didn't make it. I was short about 400 votes, you know, of getting, uh, of taking the seat, which doesn't sound like much unless you're from where I'm at from that <laughs> 400 people is probably most, of, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> not a very big, not a lot of population there. Okay. But anyway, and it really wasn't until a bunch of years later when I was, I was sitting and I had a group of young men and women around me all in their mid twenties. And, um, and, uh, um, and I was mentoring them and training them and discipling them. And, and it just happened to be around Christmas time. And I was sitting down and I was talking to them about the prophecies of Jesus. You know, we're coming up to the Advent and, and all that. And I, and, I, and I felt it was appropriate to start talking about the prophecies that told about Jesus and, and, and so on. And I'm sure you're all familiar with those. Well, I came across that one line and it says, And his government will know no end his government. And I, and I stopped <laughs> mid-sentence and I thought, whoa, wait a minute. Politically influential. Um, rebuilding. Uh, what is it? What did that scripture say? And I'm just rolling over and, you know, I had memorized Isaiah 58, 12, but and he says, and those from among you, I mean, it means your people, okay, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and they will raise up the age old foundations and you will be called the repair of the breach, the restore of the streets in which to dwell. What he's talking about here, of course, in the context, he's, he's talking about Jerusalem, okay, and raising up the, the walls after, they had, after the Babylonian captivity and, the, and everything was destroyed. And, but but the, the rhema for me here was is that he says, it's, I'm going to be politically, inf you're going to be politically influential in my government, my kingdom. And Jesus, as he says, says, he said to the, you know, before he's crucified, he says, this is not my kingdom. If this was my kingdom, my disciples would be carrying swords and they would, uh, they'd be fighting to deliver me out of your hand. But my kingdom is not of this earth. And so I began to realize that the age old foundations that he's talking about here is not the United States of America, though that's important and valuable. And I'm, you know, I'm involved in that as well. But, 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 the, but the kingdom he's talking about here, the age-old foundations, is the kingdom of heaven. And these people that are from among me, well, they're people like you. <laughs> My purpose is to help you fulfill your purpose. My destiny is to help you fulfill your destiny. It's not me that's gonna raise up the age old foundations and, and rebuild the ancient ruins. It's gonna be you, okay? But it's gonna be, but I'm gonna do my part and my part. And he says, and you will be remembered. He told me later on, he says, this is how you will be remembered. You'll be remembered as the repairer of the breach. And that is what I'm doing in these videos, is repairing the breach. So that is an example of a, of a de date with destiny, a moment in time. And I asked God, so I'm suggesting that you ask God as well. I mean, there's so many other things. I got so many examples. I can really possibly give them all to, to you, um, you know? Man, there's, I've got a bunch more written here. <laughs> um, but I'm going to think I'm going to have to skip those. Sorry. Because I want to get on to the most important part here. There's so many cool stories. But I'll, the red lighters are going to give me plenty of opportunities to share the other stories as well. So I need to just go ahead and move on. Ephesians. Now I want to talk about what is your destiny. Okay? Our destiny. Corporately which will answer your question about what your destiny is. Now, one thing I want to say is, no, no, let me back up. Let me just let the scripture speak this. Okay, this one is in uh, Ephesians. Ephesians is one of my favorite books in the Bible. Oh my gosh, one of the most favorite along, well, maybe that was Hebrews. No, actually it was Romans. No, actually it's, uh, anyway, just one of my favorite. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know, but I love Ephesians. Ephesians is an amazing book in its own way. Very unique book. But anyway, um, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, and it goes like this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Okay, we're leading up to predestination here. Okay, he says, just as he chose us in him, and when he says in him, he means in Christ. This is God the Father saying he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. Okay, he chose us before the foundations of the, wor of the world for something. Let's continue on so you'll see what it is. Um, and uh, 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 that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. God the Father speaking. He, the, God the Father saying, in love, God the Father predestined us to the adoption as sons of the Father through Jesus Christ right, through salvation, okay, to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. He has made known to us the mystery of his will. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting you to keep, a, keep track here, is that what is going on is, is, that, is that he's saying he's, 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 we're not just servants, that we have been adopted as sons, okay? And, and so... Um, and so everything that he has is purpose driven in this, okay? That he has adopted us uh, in love to a purpose and he has joined us into that purpose, okay? We're a part of that purpose. We are going to fulfill his will. When he says, you, Jesus says later, he says, when I say, he says, you see the things that I do, that I tell you that if you believe, you will do what I have done and greater things will you do. That, that you know, and when he, when he commissions them and he, when he talks about all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. And, and so he's, he's enjoining us into the process. You get this, that he has made us partners with the most high in a heavenly kingdom. We are partnered with us according to the kind intention of his will. And, and as such, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, what his will actually is. That we're not just along for the ride, okay? We're in it with him, okay? He didn't have to mean that. He could have just did it like those other people that believe that, hey, you know, there's nothing you can do. Um, some of us are going to heaven, some of us aren't, and then God's decided all that, whether you like it or not. Okay, um, they, there's no purpose in that. Okay, my only purpose is to go to heaven, and your only purpose is to go to hell. Right? I mean, that's, that's basically, you know, what it comes down to. Okay, but that's not his purpose. His purpose is to prepare himself a bride for his kingdom. And his bride is going to be holy and blameless, but she's going to be like him. She's going to, better, matter of fact, be created in his image. Okay, just the way that Eve was after Adam's image, so we are created in God's image. And so we are going to be his bride just as much as my bride is my wife. And I'm going to be the bride of Christ. And as such, I am going to be a woman without reproach. I'm going to, be, I'm going to have his admiration. I'm going to have his respect. And, and, and not only that, but I have, I have been given authority as his wife, as his bride, to fulfill his purpose. And, and he makes it. And, and so, you know, so I am in it with him. You see, you and I are unique because we are the bride of Christ. We are co-heirs to the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus calls us his brothers. <laughs> Interesting, right? Hmm. Okay, he calls us co-heirs with Christ. Does he really say that? I don't know. Let's take a look. 
okay, in love he predestined us to the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, when he, which, he, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times. An administration, does anybody know what administration is? Okay, it's, the, it's how we do business. This is what we do, the business of the kingdom. This is how it gets done. You know, there's an administration where you work, okay? And there's administration where I work. Politics has administration. Our family even has administration. There's, this is what we do and how we go about doing it. Okay, but we have been called to that administration because we have a part in it. In him we have, okay, oh, sorry, I skipped a little bit. Okay, um, with a view, view to an administration suitable to what? To the fullness of the times. What time? Well done, good and faithful servant. That, that we have something, we have a destination, we have some place we are going. There will come a moment, okay, when we will fulfill what we have been called to do. That moment will come, okay? And, and so our part, our administration in that will be suitable to that end. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and the things on the earth. What? The things in heaven and the things on earth. In him, who? Jesus. Also, we have... In him, in Jesus, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been, having been predestinated according to his purpose, who worked all things after the counsel of his will. Okay, so what have we been predestined to? Salvation, is that his purpose? Or is the kingdom of heaven, the administration of the kingdom of heaven, and causing God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why has God given us authority? Why has he left us here on the earth to do what we do? Okay, why has all that happened? Because of this, okay? And so in him also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestinated according to his purpose. We have been predestinated according to his purpose. We have been predestinated according to his purpose who works all things in heaven and in earth after the counsel of his will. Okay, wow. All right, now I'm getting close to the end here. All right, but this, Romans chapter 8, verses 18 uh, where we begin. Paul says, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Okay, so to begin with, what's going on here is that he's, he's talking about, he says that we are all going through stuff. But it's not only us that's going through stuff. All of creation is going through stuff because of a choice that Adam made. I can't wait till we get to talking about first and second Adam and all that kind of stuff when we get later in, in some later lessons. But, but, but all of creation, not just you and me, were subjected to futility and to the curse, but all of creation was subjected to it, all of it. But the thing is that creation, the only one that was at fault here was Adam. But see, Adam was in charge of everything. Okay, and so sure enough, when things happen in my family, you know, and it doesn't matter who does it, who's responsible? Dad is, because, because I'm the head of this family, and as the head of this family, the, everything that happens here, I'm responsible for. It's much that way where you work as well, you know? That in, it's that way in the military, is that, you know, that, you know that, that I'm responsible for all the things that I'm in charge of. And so bad things happen not only to me, but to those people 
that um, that I'm responsible for and the things that I'm responsible for. And so in the same way that the whole earth was, was cursed because of Adam, it, nobody else was at fault here. Nothing else in creation did it. Adam did it. And so all of creation has been suffering ever since. Then what happened is, is that second Adam <laughs> was born. He was born in a manger. And, uh, and he came to get it right, to undo what Adam did. And, and so he did. And through, and, but the only way that it could be done is as a man. He had to be a man himself, okay? Because it was a man that messed it up and only a man could make it right. But a man had to die. And so because that Jesus had to die, he, he, then who was going to make it all, everything right? Well, because Jesus died, you know? And, and because Jesus is just, well, one man, you know, and Jesus is not omnipresent because he's a physical manifestation of God. So what he did was he gave his authority. He earned it back, what Adam had lost, and Jesus earned it back and he gave it to you and then imbued and, 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 and baptized you in the Holy Spirit. And so that now you have the power and you have the authority to do what Jesus did, and I do, and you do, and you do, and you do, and everybody does. You have access to this, and you is what are the people that is talking about when he's talking about predestined, that you are predestined to be conformed to the image of the living God, that you are, you are predestined to look and become just like Jesus. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is what you're predestined to. God is that if you want to talk about destiny, everybody is destined to go to heaven. Well, no, they're all destined to go to hell. Let's put it that way correctly. But God's will is that nobody should die and go to hell. Okay. And he's made a way. But the only people that actually do go to heaven are the people that embrace the means, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that do go to heaven. Everybody has access, okay? But not everybody does go because, all right? But having done so, we now, okay, you have been called and predestined to become like Jesus, all right? And so what it says here, it says that the creation is like a woman who's waiting for the birth of a child and she's going through the, the you know, the, uh, the um, um, contractions and the pain and, and it's like, I just want to get this over with and I want to get to the good part. Does anybody relate to that? Okay, I don't want to, the, the bad part is rough, but I know there's a good part coming and I can't wait till my baby's born, but I really want to get through this. Okay, and what is the earth waiting for? What is all this creation? What is it waiting for? It's waiting, according to the scripture here, it's waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Okay? He says, um, and, and what is, I'll, I'll read it. He says, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom and glory of the children of God. So that what is, what is going to happen is, is that we, you and me, are going to be called to be kings and priests unto our God and his Father, and the earth will be subject to us and not to the curse. It, the earth will be subject now to the blessing and not the curse because of us. Specifically, it will be subjected to the sons of God, or as it says here, to the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Until when? Until now. Until when? Until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, having experienced it already, you know, the first part of this, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. The redemption of our what? The redemption of our body. What are we waiting for? The redemption of our body. Now, remember what I was saying is, is that when Jesus died, uh, this body 
that doesn't mean this body gets to go to heaven. This body's going to stay here and it's going to pay for its own sins. Okay? <laughs> okay? We're going to get a new body. It's not going to be an earthly body. This body will remain. But that being said, remember when I was talking about the communion, there's two parts. Okay? There's the blood. This is, no, actually the body. This is for now. Okay? Our body is for now, and this is the wine. This blood is forever. Okay? And this is what he's saying here. He says, for the redemption of our body through the revealing of the sons of God. You, you remember how all those people got their bodies redeemed by Jesus? Now those people went on to die eventually, right? So he only postponed the inevitable, all right, in, in that sense. But, you know, except where Lazarus was concerned, but he raised him from the dead and, well, he died anyway still, but his body was redeemed. His body, okay, they got to experience healing. They got to be relieved from their suffering. You know, it stinks to be, have leprosy. Let's put it that way. Really, really bad. Okay, never mind the here, you know, the great hereafter. What about now? Well, Jesus took, about, took care of the now, too, and he healed them of leprosy. It really stinks to be blind, you know, to go through your whole life blind. But Jesus gave them their sight, the redemption of their body, and so on. And you're probably rattling off all kinds of examples yourself right now, where Jesus stepped in, and the disciples did. And you probably have experienced yourself, and I have, where I have been healed. I've had my body restored in many ways, and I've been a part of restoring other people's bodies as well, uh, through Jesus Christ and by the whole power of the Holy Spirit. But, um, okay, um, but then he says, "'For in hope we have been saved.'" But hope that is seen is not hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. Okay, for who hopes for what he already sees? All right, so these things haven't occurred yet, but I hope, I have hope that they will. I talked already about the difference between hope and faith, you know, that faith begins as hope, but hope eventually has to decide, die, and become faith. All right, but he says, but it begins here. Okay, but we hope for what we do not see. With perseverance, we eagerly wait for it. For what? What are we talking about here? The revealing of the sons of God. This is what we're eagerly waiting for. Okay, along with creation. Um, um, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. In the same way, the Spirit also also, Jesus talking about the redemption of our body, and then the Holy Spirit has a part in this too. The, all, the Spirit also helps us somehow. How does He help us through this waiting? Um, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches the hearts and knows the mind of the Spirit is, Oh, I see. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he inter because he uh, sorry he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And and I'm going to come back to this one later time and talk about you know how this is why it's necessary that we speak in heavenly languages, okay? Because we're not speaking our words; we're speaking the words of the Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit helps us along that path because we're able to speak in, in words according to His will by His own Spirit. So the words coming out of my mouth, I don't necessarily understand them, but my Spirit understands them. And, and my, my Spirit is speaking spiritually, purely spiritual. Okay, and what is He speaking? He's speaking the words of God. And that's why those languages are necessary because, because our ability to pray in our own words and our own understanding is quite limited. And, you know, and if we want to become the sons of God and redeem the world, we've got to be able to do more. So the power and presence of the Holy Spirit and giving way to walking in the Spirit is where he goes with some of this. And we'll come back to this more later. But just to allude to it here at this point. Um, that we know the mind of God. If you want to know what God's will is, well, God will reveal it to you by His Spirit, okay? And, and that's what I'm sharing with you today, of course. Okay, and now we're getting towards where we need to be. And we know that God causes all things. Did I does this sound familiar? And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, and to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, he also predestined. 
You see, the thing is, is that God knew all of us. Remember how he said about David, he says, before you were even formed in the womb, or David said, even before I was formed in the womb, God knew me. Okay. And, and uh, no, actually it was the other way around. But anyway, regardless. Okay, that God knows us before he even created the, the world. So he foreknew us. Okay, and, and he also predestined us to do something, to become pay attention to this, to become conformed to what? To come conformed to the image of his son so that he would be, who would be? Jesus would be the firstborn among many brethren. Read that, let me read that again. For those who he foreknew, he always knew you, he also predestined you as his children to become conformed to the image of his son. What is, what is he trying to accomplish here? He's trying to accomplish that you become like Jesus. Remember what Jesus said? He says, if you believe, if you believe, you will do what I've been doing and greater things than I have done will you do. And what are the greater things? To do what Romans 8 is telling us here about redeeming the earth about establishing God's kingdom, his spiritual kingdom on earth, causing his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? And, and, and this, this waiting, what is, the, what is the earth waiting for? What are you waiting for? I'll tell you what the earth is waiting for and what the earth is waiting for and what God is waiting for. He's waiting for you. And what is he waiting for? You, for you to become conformed to the image of Jesus. Okay, and Jesus, so that Jesus will be the firstborn among many brethren. We'll become his brothers. Brothers to Jesus? <laughs> God? Okay. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Who's get, who is he glorifying? these sons of God. And so, what is your destiny? Your destiny is to become conformed to the image of the living God. Your destiny is to become a mighty man of God or a powerful woman of God. You understand what I'm saying? To become mighty, to become powerful in God's kingdom. Here I am, as I speak, fulfilling my purpose my purpose, is to, my purpose is to be politically influential in God's government. And so what am I doing? I'm attempting to influence you right now to fulfill your purpose, to become that mighty man of God, that powerful woman of God that will cause God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when, when you know, I hear Christians all the time saying, well, we just live in a fallen world. What does that mean? It means I'm a weenie. <laughs> That's what it means. It means I see the world's messed up and there is nothing I can do about it. Baloney. Because God has given you all authority and all power and in heaven and earth and he's given you the responsibility to become like him. And when somebody, you, when you see that somebody needs to be healed, then heal them. Okay, if you see a catastrophe coming, a disaster upon a community or a town, or a com and at this point, the, the, around the world with this virus has you know, been going around, okay, that it's up to you to stand in and fulfill your part and put a stop to it if it's, it's not supposed to be a fallen world anymore. The fact is, is that, you know, that these problems should have been taken care of long before you and I were ever born, long before your parents were ever born, or their parents, or their parents, or their parents. This should have been taken care of a long time ago. It should have been taken care of in the book of Acts, quite frankly, you know? But with each new generation, you see, the thing is that it, take, it seems like it takes most of us a lifetime to get to the point because we have to do things the hard way 
instead of the easy way, to where we'll begin to walk in the power and authority of Jesus Christ and, and through the Holy Spirit, okay? And to where we begin to affect and change the world. And by that time, what has happened? You know, we've outlived it, our ability to fulfill our purpose. And so now it's our children, but then our children have to go through and do the same thing over again. And then they've got to do it the hard way. And everybody wants to do it the hard way. I, I'm hoping with these videos, because not a lot of people listen these days, I mean, all you have to do is just go on there and look at how many views there are for my videos right here, okay? And you can see that there's not a lot of people that are looking for this message here, okay? And, you know, people are, don't listen. And they're just like, you know, sure enough, you got the, the Israelites. They got to go into the promised land. But then they got into the promised land, and now the giant, there's giants in the land, you know? And, you know, and there's like, and, and then there's this back and forth where we worship God and then we worship the, these, the, these foreign gods and, and, and then they're back in bondage, back out of bondage, back in bondage, back out of bondage and generation after generation after generation. One of the reasons, though, that I wanted my wife talked me into doing these videos is because there's a good chance these videos can outlive me. And maybe I'm not even around anymore when you're listening to this video. I, you know, and maybe your generation can be the generation that will do it the easy way, that will start obeying God as a young person. And maybe you can walk in power and authority. And maybe you this, are the one they're waiting for. The earth is waiting for. Maybe you're the one. You know, it says the earth is eagerly waiting for the revealing of you, of you. One thing I've talked about through this video, and I'm wrapping it up now, is that what is at stake if I don't listen? One of the things about, you know, this whole question about destiny and purpose and that kind of thing is, is that it's kind of self-serving, really, to ask that question, because most of us, are really focused on ourselves. You know, what can I do? What am I going to do with my life? Uh, how good can my life be? Uh, you know, uh, can I have power and influence? And, you know, I want to be a worship leader so that everybody will hear my voice. I want to be a pastor so that I have a mega church so I can have all these people think I'm all that. You know, um, I want to be respected and, you know, and, and so I want to know gosh, what's my destiny? And I want it to be a great thing. And, and I've had the opportunity a lot of times in the past when people have come to me and asked me, what is my destiny? And unfortunately, I had to tell them that it was something that they didn't want. They had something else in mind for their lives. And so when push came to shove, they chose what they wanted for their life, not what God wanted for their life. And so, because of that, we still live in a fallen world. The world is still subject to a curse that Jesus released it from over 2,000 years ago. See, the thing is, is that when Jesus talks about inheritance, we get it kind of, you know, we, we, we don't understand it properly. When, let's put it this way. When Jesus was talking, I'm sorry, when God was talking to Israel about their inheritance in the promised land, I think they had in their mind that they were just going to walk in there and, and everything was, and, and, and all the inhabitants of the land were just going to hand them <laughs> the keys to the kingdom. And they're like, hey, this is all, all our countries and we've built all this, and, but you know what? It's yours now. You can have it. It's your inheritance. And then they're going to walk away. But that, you and I both know, that's not what happened. The, it, it, when they walked in, this is what God promised them, is that they would face the giants, sure enough, and that they would have to pick up their sword, and they would have to go in and fight for their inheritance. But he says, this I will do, if you will obey me, and if you will do what I tell you to do it, the way I would tell you to do it, when I tell you to do it, I will deliver your enemies into your hands. You see, as Christians, what we think is that when he talks about this inheritance that I just read you about, that it's just going to be handed to you. But it's not that way at all. 
See, because we are co-heirs with Christ. It wasn't handed to him either. He had to go and do something. And it cost him his life. And I'm going to tell you something. Your inheritance is going to cost your life as well. But until somebody figures that out, enough somebodies in the body of Christ figure that out, we are going to let, continue from one generation to the next to live in a fallen world that ought not be fallen. And so I'm asking you today to consider this question. What is your destiny? Has God called you to do something? Has he called you, given a, put a calling in your heart? Is there something that he's asking you to embrace and by virtue of it, give up something very important to you? I'm pretty sure he has. And even if he hasn't, I promise you, he will. I hope that you, uh, I hope that you are who he, the earth is eagerly waiting for. I hope it's you. It, it, my, the promise that God has given me in Isaiah 58, 12 is that there will come people from me, you know, my people, the people that I get to influence, my circle, who will do something extraordinary. They will, they will uh, what did Isaiah 58, 12 say? Remember what it said? It says they'll raise up the age-old foundations. This kingdom of heaven that I'm talking about, is this a new thing? Or is it everywhere in the red letters? <laughs> the age-old foundations. Okay, this is not a new gospel. This is Jesus' gospel. His gospel is, is the kingdom of heaven. And you're going to hear me talk about it over and over again because I'm doing a red-letter study. And Jesus talks about the, about the kingdom of heaven over and over and over and over again. And so, here we are in this generation and my, the promise that God has given me is that some of you will go and you will rebuild the ancient ruins and you'll raise up the age-old foundations. And, and, um, and so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing on these videos. I'm calling to you because that is my purpose. And for now, uh, this is one of the means that God has given me to reach you and to call you to step forward and to fulfill your part in God's kingdom, the kingdom that knows no end. So I give this message to you today. This is my gift to you. Um, and I pray that you take it to heart, deep into your heart. And I pray that you'll look back on this moment when I called you. And you'll be grateful that you the, for the, what you decided to do today. To not draw any lines in the sand anymore over which you will not cross in the advancing of God's kingdom. That from this point on, when God calls you to do something, you will do it. And because you did, you'll look back and rejoice and be excited. And you'll, go, and you'll get so excited that you'll start doing what I'm doing right now. Sharing your story with the next generation. And you will say, you will be telling them, look, this is what I have experienced and this is what God is doing. And, and I'm telling you this because he's going to do it in you and through you as well. If you step forward and fulfill your purpose in God's kingdom. I know that is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because I have a debt of gratitude to the Lord which I cannot repay. Okay? And so, thank you for grace, God. And the way I show my gratitude to God for paying what I could not pay is this, that I will give you a living sacrifice, Lord. God, I will advance your kingdom. And I will tell people and I will share the good news and I'll show them and I'll, 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 I'll teach them and I'll share the stories and I will help them as you told Moses to repeat those stories over and over again so that nobody will forget. And people forget because we don't tell the story. So I'm telling the story and I'm praying that you heard the story today and you will let it change you and it will glorify you. It will lift you up and you will, you will receive unto yourself that which God has prepared for you and that you will go out 
today. And you will start asking yourself, you'll ask in God, what is it that God that you want me to do? What does my process look like for to become that mighty man or that powerful woman of God that you've called me to be? What should I do? And I already told you one of those things. Get into God's Word. Eat it. Consume it. This is the bread of life. Consume the Word of God. All right? Begin there. And as you do, it will real reveal to you everything else that you need to know that will, uh, will come. And if you, if you Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, God will make your path, your, your path straight. Amen? Amen. Thank you for joining me today. I look forward to being with you next week. And uh, I pray that I will hear testimonies and that you'll uh, give some comments as to decisions that you've made and, and uh, where, you, what you, where you plan to go and what you plan to do with the words that you've heard today regarding your destiny. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you next week. Amen.